Wednesday breakout session for the Tiny Mouse Summit. My name is Zach Shelby. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Edge Impulse, also a board member at the Tiny Mouse Foundation. Um, and I'm here to welcome you to the session about the new Tiny Mouse Vision Challenge that we have coming. Present what that's all about, how to get involved, what does it mean? Um, and then we're going to talk um, a little bit more broadly about low power computer vision, what's happening with the hardware, what's happening with the software, um, what kind of things can you do with it, and where are the applications moving that give you a little bit of inspiration for the upcoming challenge. Um, and with me, I have Corbina, who is the co founder of OpenMV, which is a really amazing low power computer vision platform. I have one always here on my desk. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> you got one of the M7 units. Nice. Yep. Yep. No, it's the H7. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, Quabino, why don't you just introduce yourself briefly, and then um, before we get started. Hi. Hi. Yes. I'm Quabino. I uh, am the president and co-founder of OpenMV. Uh, we're a uh, two-person company that's been running for about six years now, uh, more or less developing computer vision um, on microcontrollers for the edge. Um, our project first started off as us just randomly writing computer vision algorithms on a Cortex M4, and then uh, you know we had received a large amount of feedback that this was something people were really interested in and intrigued by. And as we've been developing the product, um, we've found more and more that people are really interested in this concept of being able to bring high-level computer vision functions and uh, different algorithms that you would only say you needed Linux and uh, OpenCV to run into more dedicated products. Um, and this kind of enables a new future where we can actually have sensors and uh, cameras being embedded in applications that you wouldn't think about before because you would have always imagined you needed a uh, high power computer um, there in order to perform the, uh, the application. So, you know, the future of every light switch having a camera to do person detection and being able to turn on when someone walks in the room or et cetera uh, is coming soon. That's great. Th thanks for sharing the, the vision vision behind that. And I, I, I love how these <laughs> projects start where you're hacking around on a Cortex M4 with some computer vision ideas, and then that turns into a community and that community turns into a whole movement of computer vision with real hardware products and software products. We'll come back to those. But I think that's a great, a great you know, example of the power of the developer community, how we, how we have people um, starting things and they grow really organically um, and turn into something meaningful. And that's really what the, the, the vision challenge is about for the Tiny Amount um, Foundation as well. We've started this vision challenge to help inspire people to go build more computer vision applications using tiny ML techniques um, and go get those applications eventually to market. So I'm just going to share a short slide deck. I won't, I won't bore you all with slides too much. About um, this year's new vision challenge. Um, so tiny ML vision challenge 2021. Um, this is a preview. So the challenge is going to be opening up um, on April 15th. We've uh, created and are hosting the challenge together with the Hackster community. So many of you might be familiar with Hackster IO. If you're not, do check it out. Really cool um, platform for sharing articles and projects that you've created on embedded hardware. So if you're creating hardware projects or embedded software projects, this is the place to go tell people about them and get people you know, working with you and starting to collaborate on ideas. Um, <clears throat> they're very good at hosting challenges as well. So we've worked together to put together this tiny ML vision challenge. Um, and we'll share a little bit more of a sneak preview of what it's going to be about, help you get your um, ideas going about how to participate. So what's the goal of the vision challenge? You know, for us as a community, what, what do we have in mind with this? And, you know, first for me is a lot of people don't really realize that computer vision is part of tiny ml like when i hear people in uh, the developer communities or in industry talk about tiny ml sometimes they think it's sensors right uh, accelerometers and things like that or maybe audio with keyword spotting um and it's only recently that we've started to see more activity on the vision side but you know as we've already heard with from from corbena about the integration of computer vision and like cortex m4 
it's happening, right? We're seeing a lot of computer vision on small, low power um, targets. And that's only accelerating, like already in the tiny ML summit this week, almost half of the papers, um, different hardware and software presentations we've seen have been some in some part about low power computer vision. So it's happening exactly. and it's growing. Zach, can you comment on um, what's the distribution of uh, projects on Edge Impulse now that uh, utilize, uh, you know, when the Open MVCAM was added to there, like how many projects now are actually being developed using Open MVCAM or other computer vision sensors? That's a good question. Um, we do track statistics on kind of percentage of hardware targets that are used in projects at deployment. Um, I don't know those off the top of my head, but if I'd have to guess, I'd say that at least 30 or 40% of the projects on Edge Impulse are computer vision related on different targets. OpenMV is one of the most popular ones. Mm -hmm. So we have 16,000 projects today. So we're talking about five, 6,000 projects that are already have been created, you know, using low power computer vision. That's a, that's a really good point. We're, we're seeing this from the community as well. Um, what we want to do with a challenge like this is we want to make sure that we're including everybody that is interested in computer vision and interested in deploying that on low power devices. We're including the tiny ML community and we're making sure we're connecting everybody who's interested in this space, right? Not only people in the ac academic world, but individual developers, professional developers, people working for startups and larger companies. We want everybody, everyone to be part of the same community. Um, so that's the number one goal of the, the vision challenge. Um, the second goal is that we have a lot of people in the community that talk about uh, research, talk about the latest you know, gadget um, quantization aware training technique. We talk about new architectures for machine learning, computer vision, lots and lots of the technologies, but we don't talk nearly enough about the applications. We're, we kind of have like a, a lack of applications in our community. And I think that's the most inspiring part of this. When people build real things and show us what's possible, those become really important case studies. They become really important examples for others. And eventually they inspire real products. So we've seen a lot of people go from participating in challenges with an idea and turning that into a startup even in some cases. So it's a great way to get people starting on new applications. So, so two, Let's showcase the most inspiring new applications of computer vision with tiny amount. So two big goals that we have with the challenge. Um, what is it going to take to participate in this? So these challenges um, that we developed together with Hackster are pretty open. Um, you could be an individual developer. You can work in a team. So teams are allowed up to five people. You do need to be 13 or older to be considered a participant or to be younger than that you need a you need a waiver from from a, a guardian um and what we're looking for are entries that solve in a problem right so solve a real problem it doesn't have to be you know rocket science that you're solving it could be a very um simple everyday problem but it should have an impact right so do something innovative or do something that has impact um, with your application we are looking for people to implement and demonstrate the solution. So this isn't just like sketch up a mock-up on paper or describe the problem. We want someone to actually implement this, show that it works. It doesn't have to be production ready, but show that the concept works, right? That this is possible on, on the computer vision hardware um, and software tools that you have. And we'll give extra points for great presentation. So the way this works is that if you can, you know, record a video of the solution, right? Explain the benefits, make it look really good. That does get you extra points. Um, these projects do get documented, so we do want people to document the whole process, document the hardware design, the software design, share the code that you used with the community. We want people to try to reproduce these projects if they want, so it gives people like a tutorial starting point. So, so do document the process carefully. And then finally, um, we don't have strict requirements on the exact hardware that you need to use or the exact software framework that you need to use. You could be creative, use anything that's available. Um, in a moment, we'll talk about some of the hardware platforms that are available. We'll hear more about OpenMV. And so you get some ideas for what you might use, but that's not a requirement. The only requirement is this thing should be battery powerable, right? We don't want to have something that needs a heat sink and, and sucks several watts of power. Design something um, that 
that can be battery operated. And if you can demonstrate low power operation, even better, right? Extra points for doing that. So a lot of flexibility in this. And, and the scale of hardware here could be anywhere from like low end Cortex M0 plus, we've seen people running stuff on like Arduino nanos, all the way up to Raspberry Pi class devices, as long as you can optimize the power consumption and duty cycle. So you've got a pretty wide range of stuff that you can work with. And then finally, um, some important dates uh, around the challenge. We're gonna open up the challenge uh, for people to indicate um, interest. So you can, you can register as a participant. Uh, and then the submission deadline will be in August. We might adjust this a bit, but we're looking at August 20th as submission deadline. So you have a good amount of time from, from now until um, finishing projects. And on September 1st, we'll look to announce the winners of the, the contest. Um, and we are rewarding people. Of course, you're gonna get fame, the winners of this top prizes. We'll do a lot of promotion. We'll showcase the case studies. We'll put it out there. And we're looking to give teams, winning teams, cash prizes, um, starting at $3,000, going on to $1,000, plus potentially hardware prizes from our sponsors. And that, that brings me to the last um, really important point. There is a sponsorship opportunity here for companies in the community. So if you have, you're working for a company or leading a company that cares about computer vision, wants to be associated with helping people create amazing computer vision um, applications, you can become a sponsor of the challenge with the Tiny ML Foundation. Um, that's a cash contribution. Plus, you can give hardware prizes away to participants that win as well, or even give hardware prizes away to everyone who participates if you have enough hardware. So if you're interested in that, um, reach out to myself and Ira from the foundation, and we're happy to help you. So, so with that, um, I wanna open it up to, to talking a little bit more about this on the technology and platform side um, with Quamina and then everyone in the audience um, to dig into um, what are some of the platforms and techniques, what are some of the applications that are possible today with this stuff? And so I think we could start with that. Like hardware is always really interesting for all of us. You know, what is the range of hardware today where computer vision is possible, right? Where we can do useful things. What, what's kind of your feeling right now? Um, <laughs> well, I can get the little email ding there. Um, yeah, so I, I think a lot of people really underestimate exactly how much power a Cortex-M class device actually has when you really get into optimizing what a lot of these socks are capable of. Um, so when we started the OpenMV project, um, we thought we were writing decent C code um, that the compiler would optimize and do a good job for us. Um, but the reality is, if you actually get into using the uh, Cortex SIMD instructions that they made available for different various uh, image, pro well, they're mainly for audio processing, it's actually possible to really optimize a lot of image processing operations and get huge speed boosts that enable uh, this low powered machine vision in the real world. An example, um, ARM released a library called CMIS NN about, uh, I guess it's been two and a half years now. Um, and that's not even the most optimized thing you could do, but um, that code base was able to speed up inferencing on a, uh, for pretty much all Cortex-M devices by about 5x. And the benefit of that was just the way they did loops, the way they uh, put together the basic ins assembly instructions, and then utilizing some of the features in the hardware. Um, for ourselves, we've been really going on a journey lately with OpenMV on optimizing our computer vision functionality. So an example, um, we had JPEG compression running on the OpenMV cam where it was struggling to do 15 FPS VGA. And we thought that was the best we could hit. Um, that was just what the hardware was capable of. It was not going to go faster. And so after meeting a performance optimizer, a guy named Larry uh, Bank back in 2000, I think it was 2019 um, on the, uh, the ARM IoT Dev Conference, really great conference. Can't wait till that's happening in person again. It was amazing. Um, you know, I really learned a lot about uh, what kind of speed I was leaving off the table. And so we're now able to push 60 FPS VGA compression through the same piece of hardware um, with just, in, with actually less code, of course. So you go faster, usually your code's smaller, um, and, and really get the best out of a piece of hardware. 
Um, and so if you think about that, that's a 4X improvement really in your throughput with just modifying what you can do in code. And so a lot of what uh, microcontrollers can do nowadays, a lot of the performance that's possible is just not even unlocked um, because the effort put into really uh, writing good code is not there. Um, so with the OpenMV project, what we're really trying to do is build out that library of computer vision functionality right now to enable all microcontrollers to really be pushed to the limit in order to perform and, and offer amazing features. That's that's that like that that sixty frame per second itself on a Cortex M7 is amazing, right? That that's extremely high frame rates that you're able to process. Um, mm -hmm. And we're seeing the same trend, right? We're seeing these optimizations in the low level operators for computer vision processing as well as machine learning, right? To go to smaller and smaller parts. So the the kind of low end of what we see today starts already at Cortex M0 plus, right? No FPU. Usually pretty low frequencies, 48, 40 to, to 60 megahertz is pretty typical. Um, we're seeing like the Arduino Nano BLE Sense get hooked up to really simple vision elements to do very basic computer vision tasks, not really machine learning yet, or very simple machine learning, classical machine learning approaches. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that's really amazing, right? So we've gone down to the Cortex M0 plus level. You know, you started on Cortex M4 and ended up going to Cortex M7. Um, in order to to process a little, little bit more complex, higher resolution stuff. Well, you know, what's Cortex M zero? Like, I just watched a uh, a webinar about binary neuralized um, BNNs. I'm not sure if uh, Edge Impulse is going to add support for that, or if TensorFlow Lite is going to have better support for that. But when you mm -hmm. look at what a Cortex M zero plus can do. Right, it, it's like the lowest end of the, of the Cortex family. It really doesn't have any of the DSP instructions, so it can't do much, but it can do XOR operations on 32 bits, you know, very yeah. efficiently. It's able to do yeah. that and it's got the pop count instructions, so it can count 32 bits. And that's enough to do um, in a binary neuralized network, XOR plus pop count is effectively the convolution operation mm. and so that processor can do you know at 32 by 32 well sorry a um not 32 by 32 but you can imagine a five by five convolution window effectively in two instructions um wow. in a binary neuralized neural network scheme of things but that's still that still means that uh that's going to, if you can reduce a network size to fit in that kind of weight category, you can you can have that system punching at the level of 32x times, well, 32 times its clock speed in terms of the number of operations that it would normally be able to do. So we may be able to unlock even more with new neural network architectures as well on these smaller cortex M parts. That, that's great, that could benefit computer vision for sure. Um, mm -hmm. We're also seeing accelerator, acceleration start to, start to play a role. So um, in the lineup of kind of low power microcontroller based vision parts, you know, we've recently seen HiMax release a part with a computer vision element and a DSP. And that was really interesting because we saw that DSP unlock a bunch of extra compute that we hadn't seen before in performance. So I think that's interesting how acceleration is coming into this space more broadly. Like we're going to expect to see neural network accelerators um, that can support computer vision architectures. Um, ARM has the Ethos U55 accelerator coming into this world. That will probably let us do a little bit more computer vision right on the smaller parts, right? Go to slightly more complex um, operations and more complex neural networks. Where, where do you kind of see the limit today on like the, the Cortex M class, the op open MV class of device before we've gotten to acceleration. What what is possible? Like what can you do with computer vision and and tiny ML with neural networks? Well, well, let me first say um, the future is really bright. Um, so you have ARM, well, the ARM Core M55 is coming, you know, very soon, and so we're going to see mm -hmm. that in silicon um, and in mass development, well, mass deployment by 2023. So within about two years, um, it's going to be the case that you can buy ARM Core M55, probably even sooner. Mm -hmm. And um, if you if you haven't heard about this processor, it's a new uh, it's the newest Cortex uh, series processor from ARM. And this this processor is going to be able to basically do 128-bit uh, SIMD math, 
on the CPU. So basically 16 8 bit multiplies per clock. Um, and they've it, that's effectively equivalent to Neon, more or less, that uh, Cortex A CPUs run. And so this is going to be really coming to all microcontrollers, well, the latest microcontrollers. Um, additionally, and that's called uh, that's called the Helix vector extensions, right? That's what I'm being familiar uh, with. I think. Yes, yes, the Helion. Uh, Helion, I think it, it, it's the vector extension he, they're offering. He, Heli, so, Heli, something. The ARM guys can correct us, but there's a Healy something vector extension. I think mean, that's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and 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 so once that's released, that's going to, I mean, that just in general, that's all algorithms. So it's quite a bit more useful than just being mm -hmm. able to do uh, neural network performance because there are algorithms that you have to run in order to prepare images for being run on a neural network. An example, mm -hmm. um, if you want to do something like lens correction or debayering, um, well, debayering you can get hardware acceleration for, but lens correction or uh, perspective correction. These are the algorithms that you really want to run beforehand in order to uh, make the data more suitable for a neural network to run on. And so that's going to be uh, super be beneficial once those hit the market. That'll really, really improve the resolution of what uh, new MCU platforms are going to be able to do. But um, furthermore, I, I think you're also going to see that in combination with processors like the Eth Ethos. Is that how you pronounce it? I call it ethos. Ethos doesn't matter. Um, yeah, yeah. The U, the U fifty five. That's the safe way to say the it. U fifty five. U fifty five. Yeah. So there's going to be other, you know, neural network CPU accelerators coming on board in combination with the M fifty five core, and so that's going to give you that mix of general purpose MD hmm. along with specialized uh, cores that are just great at running neural networks themselves. Right. So that could um, maybe, you know. Maybe that could push us up into the object detection world of machine learning oh. already in microcontrollers. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And that's going to let you more or less the, detect an object and detect a, well, bounding boxes very easily, but actually do real uh, applications where you can localize a object in 3D mm -hmm. space and not just right. draw a bounding box around it, but actually know where that bounding box is. Um, extra question that a lot of people don't look at, but it's not particularly useful to have a bounding box on an object if you don't know where that object is. It's better if you can actually relate distance to it. Um, That's right. But yes. And and what about today's, you know, Cortex-M7 based, because in this challenge, right, we're starting next month, we're going to go until the end of summer. W what can we do today with these, these Cortex-M based platforms like OpenMV? You know, what is possible? Can you go to object detection in theory today? Um, or are we doing like image classification and other kinds of um, like simple uh, classification problems on the MCU side? And we'll we'll talk about this, the the MPU CPU side as well in a moment. Well, um, so right now uh, the focus for OpenMV has just been to optimize more basic uh, algorithms because we've noticed a huge mm -hmm. demand from people for our system and it's become increasingly apparent that the platform was not developed enough and not invested in. Um, so we're mainly focusing our development effort on bringing out really high performance uh, perspective correction code, lens correction code, JPEG compression and decompression, um, reading image file formats. Um, so like uh, uh, BMP, uh, PNG, JPEG, uh, uh, and uh, other various formats, and then reading and writing. You know, pretty much just building up the basic platform in order to enable mm -hmm. folks to actually have something comparable to OpenCV to even develop with, so they don't have to worry about input and output not existing in, a, in, in the way that they want. Um, and then for the actual algorithms themselves, uh, so with uh, with CMS NN, we're actually able to do about 12 to 16 FPS on the Cortex-M7, the OpenMV cam. Um, and if you were using the, I, the IMX uh, RT, you could probably get up into the around 30 FPS territory with their like latest one gigahertz platform um, for doing simple uh, image classification. Uh, as for localization though, um, we've really been waiting on uh, someone to kind of release a network architecture that could do something like image segmentation or uh, bounding mm -hmm. box detection. Um, that's really dependent on the architecture search though. I think what's really made it possible for you know everyone to do image classification very easily was that MobileNet out of the box does that. Um, yeah. 
and so I, I guess it would be, you know, when whenever there's like we don't really have any memory limitations per se on the on the on the uh, open MVCAM H7 plus we, we attach 32 megabytes of SD RAM to it. And so it's quite capable of running any network really, albeit slow. But um, I think the next step is really someone releasing architecture that uh, is suitable for doing bounding box detection. That's awesome. So, so there's also an opportunity here for the TinyML community to help contribute to some of these um, frameworks like TensorFlow Lite Micro that could be run on OpenMV, right, to bring in some of the right architectures for object detection if you want to use that. And I'm sure that we'll see the general tooling start to support this more broadly as well. So I could expect that we're going to be able to support object detection at least at lower frame rates, right? Because with object detection, the problem is you have a you have a very cyclical um, thing that you're doing, right? You're not only looking for an image pattern, you're looking for an image pattern over and over again, right? Throughout the the image space, so you're gonna you're gonna end up spending a lot more time to do that. So we might see lower frame rates, but that's okay. I think many of the applications that people care about are low frame rate applications, <clears throat> one, two, three frames per second you can do a lot with, right? If that's something you're detecting an animal, you're detecting you know, persons in the image, you don't need to run at necessarily 15 or 30 frames per second. Um, I would say though that the, the your inference time has a big impact on power consumption. So the, the faster you can get done with, with inference on an image, the faster you can go to sleep. So that will have a big impact on power consumption. So we can expect to see object detection come into the MCU space um, very soon. And And before we talk about do you have like more the to CPU talk about class? <laughs> Absolutely. Before we talk about the CPU class, and then we're going to go and talk to the audience about their questions here. Um, one final question for you, just to help people think about how to get started. You know, what's the best way to get started with OpenMV Camps? If you wanted to use this in this challenge, like how do you get started as a developer? Um, yeah. So I think the best thing to buy would be our OpenMV Cam H7 Plus. Uh, it has SD RAM attached, so it doesn't have any frame. Like we're 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 doing a few things. So we're we're, we're constantly updating the firmware and adding new features. And so uh, one of those new features is going to be double buffering coming soon, which will max out the frame rate no matter what. And then also we're going to be put. It also just has more it has RAM attached, and so this really reduces a lot of the problems people ran into with our current with our more MCU variants, um, like the H7 normal. And so that's uh, you know dark resolution and network size limits when you don't have SD RAM. And while those are, you know, you obviously would like and prefer to have your network run on the internal SRAM of the processor. Uh, it does mean though that you run into situations where uh, you can't even uh, start iterating because your network won't even run at first. You can't even get to the point where you're shrinking it. And so that just makes your life a lot harder. Um, so being able to have that kind of relaxed boundary problem, and then you can start developing, and then you can kind of iterate your, you know, model and kind of make it faster and smaller and et cetera in order to get it to fit on internal SRAM on a product um, is great. particularly nice and easier to deal with. Um, That's great. And yeah, I mean, documentation and support has been out for a year um, with Edge Impulse on that platform. Um, Raspberry Pi also is another thing you can choose to go with. Uh, it's a little bit higher power, though. Um, so, and then the HiMax also is another uh, platform that I think uh, Edge Impulse is representing. I don't know exactly though what's the development experience like on that. I can't comment. Do you have more information, Zach? It's just the basic um, image capture um, ML algorithm deployment cycle. There isn't like a uh, uh, an OpenCV style image pre-processing um, phase there that's automated. So it's a little bit different but it just focuses on the ML side. And I, I think you'll see that with a lot of these image platforms. So you named a couple, but I think we should talk about that briefly before we go into questions. There are a lot of different platforms out there you can get started with. So we've talked about OpenMV Cam, we've talked about HiMax's development board. Um, we have platforms from, from Arduino, both on the Nano BLE with a little camera that's attachable, as well as the new Arduino Portenta has a vision shield that you can work with. That's also OpenMV compatible. Um, we've seen uh, new image platforms from Qualcomm, for example. I see you have Jenny on the call. Don't know if we can get those in the hands of developers for the challenge, but we might work on that. 
Um, and then, of course, you know, we have the ubiquitous Raspberry Pi. And, and I think for this challenge, that also is a great platform to start experimenting with, with the vision, with the ML algorithms. Just keep in mind that you want to aim at low power, right? So don't go and take the largest model you can find. Try to do something that is really highly optimized so you can increase your sleep cycles. And that will let you put a Raspberry Pi into a lower power application. So you've got a great range of computer vision platforms that are available today. Or if you're a hard, hardcore developer, go and create your own. I think that's completely game, and I'm sure you'll get lots of extra points from that. You know, go design your own hardware. A lot of this, this stuff is open, open hardware, open source. You can go design your own, your own thing, and show us how that works. So be, be okay. creative. I, I think the best way to say it would be one of the points of this is to think about, okay, what kind of product could I could I make if I'm not constrained by a, a current dev board size and shape. And so being able to buy the chips that make up that dev board on the open market is, is kind of one of those things you'd want to do that to kind of show that, hey, you know, if I wanted to build a product out of this, I could. And we have yeah. one addition from the from the community, by the way. So David on the on the chat um, reminded us that Eta Compute just released a low power computer vision platform just recently. So that's a small right. board with a camera that's super low power. So I think we've, we're starting to get a really nice variety of computer vision platforms that, that you can get a hold of easily and go use. Um, yeah. I'd love to open up um, for questions from the audience. And then I, I have some questions that to talk about applications still. Right. I, 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 yeah, I, ha I have one. I think it's great to see that we are going to use a variety of different hardware platforms and just focus on the application. I think that that is going to be amazing to see a variety of applications like when, and ideas what people are going to come up by, by, by August. Uh, so far, I think we had a discussion mostly on an ARM-based platform, right? But what, what about other mm -hmm. platforms, like like Risk Five, for example, like like what GreenWave has, for example, right? Um, can you guys have co yeah. co comments on Risk Five specifically? I mean, how how do you enable more beyond ARM? Because like ARM is everywhere, obviously, but like um, we would like also to encourage other hardware and ASIC type of design type of people to to. to oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think. Oh, do you mind go ahead. It's going to say you. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh yeah. No. So, uh, Risk Five is great. Um, the uh, I think the challenge is the tooling there is so different um, that that makes it a little bit more challenging to work with. Uh, I think TensorFlow uh, has been has is TensorFlow running on uh, on Risk Five now for like for microcontrollers. I believe there are some mappings from like the Gap Eight folks to to map TensorFlow to their own compiler tools to run on the the Risk Five part. So we do we do see people putting together, but I don't know if it's the out of the box standard experience, but it's definitely possible. Oh yeah, well I, I think though you're you're going to be using kind of vendor tools a little bit more in that situation, but I think mm -hmm. that's no. I mean that still is the whole idea of this uh, contest is just to enable people on these low power platforms. So the Gap Eight's fine to use. I think the Gap Nine also uh, has come out or is, is available, so that would be also another great platform. Right. We're also seeing a lot of people in the community use ESP thirty twos. So ESP thirty two is a perfectly fine platform for um, machine learning workloads. But again, you've got to do some kind of manual optimizations for the operators because they don't take use make use of the standard acceleration libraries. So that may be a bit of extra work to do. But ESP32 is a, a solid platform for computer vision. Um, and I think we're going to continue to see that variety in the architectures. I don't think it really matters so much what MCU it is, what MCU architecture. I think it's more about getting together the software tools that you can use tiny amount to, to, to deploy on that device. That's, yeah. that's going to be the, 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 the challenge. And you're going to be able to buy lots of different platforms that do that. And, you know, one example is, of course, SparkFun carries a lot of these different computer vision platforms. So SparkFun's a great place to look for these things. Also, Seed Studio has a ton. So if you look at Seed Studio, a huge range of different computer vision platforms, like 10 more than we've even mentioned for all kinds of applications. So you might find something interesting there. Yeah, the, the trick is, though, this is a competition. So the goal is to develop your idea, not the library. So that's the one problem you'll have. Good point. Yeah. Make sure you focus some time on solving your application too, not just hacking up the hardware. So try to start with something that's pretty proven and, and works. I think that would be good advice. Um, and then focus your energy on building a great application. Show us what's possible. 
So, Any so other like, questions from? So go ahead. Like I, I have one more. So just a clarification type of question on a, on the age. I think if I understood it correctly, you talked like people have to be eighteen and older to submit. Or, thirteen or older. Oh, they have to be yeah. considered yeah. adults in the U.S. Yeah, <laughs> thirteen or older. But but actually, we've had um we've had in previous challenges I've seen, we've had younger children enter with their parent. So we've actually right. seen like on a previous competition, somebody made a snore detector with for neosensory. And that was like a 11 or 12 year old boy with his father. They were the team. So it is possible to have someone younger. You just need to sign yeah. a waiver. And no, that, that, that's great because I was, I, I was about to defend the youngsters just to make sure we're not excluding them because there, are, there is so much interest in the tiny male in high school and the K-12 type of people. Oh, yeah. just. I think I'm sure Completely they fair game. With, with, with great ideas. Yep. Yeah, I'm already seeing 14 and 15 year olds who are better engineers than I am these days, but that's what happens when you become a CEO, <laughs> you lose all your skills. So, yeah, we, we definitely want to encourage the, the high school age um, um, up and coming hackers to get involved and they, they build incredible applications. So, so yeah, we, right. should, we should make sure to promote that in that way. And I think we are going to probably cross promote it through the educational channel because, as you know, we are kicking off uh, in addition to the tiny ML for good and the, this uh, mm -hmm. um, challenge vision challenge. We are starting a tiny ML educational program, so connecting all the way to the K twelve folks. So I think we'll definitely cross cross promote it there as well. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Um, any other questions from the audience? You can put yourself off of mute and speak up to ask a question, or you can. Or you can go into the chat and we can pick it up from there. We'll give a moment for that and then we will um, talk a little bit more about applications, what we're seeing people build on these platforms. So question from David to the to the group, um, how low power is low power? That that's a good question. Um we uh, you're always gonna spend energy when you're on right when your microcontroller is on at full clock speed when you're running machine learning inference or maybe running some pre-processing for computer vision you know that is when you're going to consume energy so you do need to think about your your power consumption in your on state um you know low power today for computer vision is anything less than like 10 milliwatts is already really low power less than 100 milliwatts is still something that you can easily run on battery because the rest of the time you're probably going to be sleeping so don't don't think of computer vision as that you're on absolutely all the time. You can you can build applications with duty cycle. Maybe take a frame, work on it, go back to sleep. So you need to look at both your on power consumption and your off. For this challenge, we try to keep this pretty flexible. So our requirement is this needs to be able to run on a battery, a reasonable battery. And I don't mean a car battery. I mean something that's portable. Make this something that can actually be deployed out there on a reasonably sized battery. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, and we don't expect people to be done with their final optimizations, right? Do do the optimization you can, and then tell us what you built. And, and Zach, just to add to this, definitely power depends on on the frame rates, right? If you can run it at one frame mm -hmm. rate, ten or hundred. But yep. I think the, the the key here we are focusing on on the application, and some application may require duty cycle, like uh, let's say retail type of environment. You you take an mm -hmm. image like once an hour, right? Or the other one, okay. like motion type of applications, you need to run it at 10 frames per second. I think it's probably the key to make sure, like like you said earlier, to enable this battery operated vision uh, at application specific, whatever this particular application requires, right? To to to, to make it functional, sure. practical. And and battery has to be like a coin coin cell battery. So, like, so I, would <laughs> say, oh, <laughs> I would say it's like this. It's really just you know, are you using a platform where the concept of sleeping, you know, and waking up in less than a second is normal? That's really what I would say. So the the problem with a Raspberry Pi isn't that it can't, it doesn't classify as low power so much. Um, the problem would be that it's kind of like if I wanted to deploy this as a sensor embedded in some kind of low power application, there's I don't really have the ability to uh, minimize the size of the system because I'm constrained to a particular board shape I have to buy, and then I'm not able to really uh, turn this thing off in any way, shape, or form. 
um, that demonstrates that I could build a product that would be low power. I don't really have those controls. I think that's a good point, right? You're going to limit yourself a little bit if you go into these larger platforms. Um, and it's a lot harder to implement a low power sleep cycle, wake up cycle on Linux compared to what you can do in RTOS um, on a microcontroller. So that, that also is going to limit what you can do with low power. But for the point, purpose of the applications in this challenge, what we're really looking for is people to show us that applications can be built low power. We don't have to necessarily show the lowest power consumption possible but explain, show, design how that could be deployed as low power. And I think that already goes um, a long way. So we have another question from the audience. Um, will there be sponsored hardware that people can apply for? Um, not yet. However, um, depending on the sponsors that come on board, we may be able to offer some sponsored hardware. I saw a sad face already. All right. People love um, hardware. We may be able to offer some sponsored hardware as part of the challenge, but that's going to depend on sponsors. So if you want your favorite sponsor to come on board, go give them a push. Tell them that hey, they need to be on on top of this vision challenge. And and um, we can get that going. will be available to offer sponsored hardware for anyone who can demonstrate they app applied to the program. Um, well, it is competing in the competition and wants to use an open MV cam. We can make that available. Uh, I would say there's a limit on that, like. You know, if 100 people show up and say that, I can't do that. But if it's not 100 people, if it's some reasonable number, then uh, we can we can make that happen. Um, and we'll also have some more interesting hardware coming out later this year during the competition that will allow some people to do some pretty cool stuff. Uh, nice. The only thing I would say is that there is a chip shortage right now happening. So hardware development on platforms is a getting new things on the market is particularly challenging. <laughs> um, that's an aside. Not so if you can find if you can find some computer vision hardware, get it right now because it might not be available yeah. later. But but yeah, yeah. Super, super generous offer from OpenMV. So we're gonna we are gonna see possibility to apply for some OpenMV hardware up to a limited number for people who are um, using it in the challenge. So we'll 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 see how to to take care of that application process and and let you um, go through those to choose the best the best applications. So already getting a little bit of free hardware. That's awesome. Um, <clears throat> any other questions that people have? And then we want to talk a little bit about applications before we're out of time here. And and if somebody wants to start with applications, some of the applications that they are seeing people build. With computer vision, we'd love to hear that because we want to already get the thoughts going for people what they want to work on, what might be possible. So, anybody have some some comments uh, or ideas on applications for tiny ML based computer vision? I see Luke on the call at least too. I know he's been building some pretty cool stuff with computer vision. Um, you could hear from Luke some of the ideas that he has um, based on work that he's done. Put you on the spot, Luke. Right. Okay. We'll let you come back with that. So while we wait for for Luke, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of overview of what we're seeing in the in the industry. Right. What we see industrial customers coming and asking for when it comes to computer vision. So the the thing that we're seeing really often is people in manufacturing coming to us with really 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 specific manufacturing problems. These aren't things like facial recognition or even mask recognition. They're things like, are there um, cracks in this metal, right? Are there wrinkles in this fa this fabric or paper? Um, is this thing like of uneven surface um, surface density or surface thickness or thickness of a material? Um, is this bolt on correctly in automobile manufacturing? We're seeing tons of applications like this come our way. Um, we are uh, seeing computer vision make its way into white goods, so appliances of all types. So we're seeing tons of different different kinds of computer vision applications in white goods. Sometimes that's food identification, people identification as well. Um, and then we we're we're seeing the same with buildings and occupancy. So that's something that I think that will become very popular as people come back to work and come back to workplaces is understanding how people move, right? How people move in spaces, what spaces do they use, how often are they using it? So this kind of occupancy detection of, of people movement is becoming a big thing. So a few few of the areas that we see lots of computer vision um, applications in 
um, to get the thoughts going. But we'll go, I'll head it over to you. Um, yeah, so hold on, just uh, answering a little message from a colleague. Um, yeah, 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 so. Yeah, I think while you while you're doing the message uh, answer, maybe I, I can add to what Zach said. I think what what we see uh, a lot of applications like when the vision triggers something else. That's kind of one broad category. Uh, uh, anomaly detection. Let, let's say uh, you have uh, some. I don't know. All of a sudden, uh, you're in a big city and something happens, and then people are going to run in one direction or in a different direction, right? So th 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 this kind of thing. So it's uh, anomaly detection, a lot of things in the retail logistics space. And I, I think, and one, probably one of my favorite is like what we discussed at the tiny mill for good yesterday is in, in the wildlife conservation, animal control, um, agriculture, this kind of thing, I think tons of opportunities for vision in, in, in these areas, for, 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 for good areas. Just kind of turn on your imagination or try to find a problem near you near, near and, and kind of think about how vision can help and i think related to this i think one of kind of things that i always remember about vision i think we'll, we'll talk about this also tomorrow is uh, that about 90 percent of human perception comes through eyes through vision i mean whatever we see around that's basically this little computer vision devices can help to solve any kind of problems around us kind of in a very broad sense Really good point. Um, hey, let's uh, let's give Luke a chance to to chime in, and then um, Kabina will we'll talk to talk about your application. I have this in a moment here. Yeah, uh, one really sort of basic use case we're looking at is simply having it be a vision wake up system. So, um, you know, before yeah. you go power on, you know, your your Raspberry Pi or something that might take a bit longer, at the Coral Accelerator, you know, being able to have a very low power system that has a, con a much higher duty cycle. Um, so we can constantly see, like, is there a person or a vehicle in this space? And then power up something that has more compute to say, what type of vehicle is in this space? Is it the trash truck that's finally coming through to pick up my garbage? Um, and then, you know, do those sort of analytics and have it go back to sleep. So, you know, just ways you can use, uh, you know, different different qualities uh, so you can extend battery life and have things last longer. So two two stage visual wake words, then going into a more complex, um, more complex. Uh, classification process, for example. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Oh, interesting. Thanks. Well, um, I, I wanted to comment on uh, so the kinds of stuff that we see a lot of people using the Open MVCAM for are all in related to that manufacturing kind of process level, uh, and, and then also again like anomaly detection and detecting um, you know things inside a built environment. Uh, these are these are applications that so like uh, you know here's a, one of the most trivial examples but very straightforward. Uh, you mount a camera. Its whole job in life is to stare at a set of rotating digits on a mechanical dial, and what it does is it digitizes mechanical digits into a uh, by, into a numeric string, and then it <laughs> will uh, basically text that string out over a um, a low raw serial port. And report, um, you know, in a wide area network that information back to a host system. And so the way this works is the, you know, the open MV cam, for example, would wake up every 15 minutes. So when we're talking about power cycling, that's kind of what I mean. Like it's asleep for 15 minutes at a time. It wakes up and proceeds to capture an image um, with good contrast and good quality. Um, it then runs a neural network. Uh, so with the OpenMV Cam library, at least, you're allowed to select an ROI of the image and, and then run the neural network on that ROI. And so uh, it already knows where each digit is located in the image because it's a fixed system, right? And so the camera turns on, uh, you do some basic lens correction to make sure everything's nice and straight looking. Um, and then you proceed to capture an ROI of a particular area where the number is, and then you have a numeric, a neural network is just doing uh, uh, basically numeric classification of each number. And so you say, okay, what number is this here? Is it a zero through nine? Zero through nine, zero through nine, zero through nine, zero through nine. And after you do that, then you build up the text string and boom, you've read out the value of a mechanical digit uh, a meter and you can send that through a serial port and then you go back to sleep. And so that whole process of recognizing it takes less than 
you know, 500 milliseconds and the camera's back to sleep again, drawing, you know, about 10 milliamp years or less of power. Amazing. That's a great example of a, of a really simple application. Sounds simple, but has really meaningful, meaningful use. Mm -hmm. um, we have a few comments on the, on the chat as well. So, um, animal tracking using a trail cam, I think that's a great example. Um, in nature conservation, we see lots and lots of applications for camera traps. Um, a project we've been involved with recently, you might have um, read in the BBC about <clears throat> uh, zoos in the UK collecting 30,000 thermal elephant images. So using a thermal, thermal camera, um, looking at different, different angles of elephant um, imagery with the thermal camera and using that to develop um, tiny machine learning uh, applications for identifying elephants um, in the wild. And that's an application we've actually worked on to make use of that imagery on low power platforms. So these kind of like an animal um, identification using tiny ML and vision, I think is a great application area. Um, another well, application also, that, um, go ahead. Well, well, it's also, it's just like false positive redu reduction. So a great example would be um, before the kind, of, the kind of rise of ML in the world, um, if you, for example, if you want to do like a, a camera trap, you can buy these cameras you know, for like $100 that come in a super robust packaging and they have a motion detector sensor. And whenever any motion is detected, they capture a whole bunch of images. The only problem is it'll capture hundreds of images of a bucket rolling around or other various things because it doesn't do any um, recognition it doesn't look at the images at all and, and bother to think does this contain interesting information and so just having a low power system that's there to just do basic pre-filtering of does this image have something useful going on in it is still incredibly helpful that's a great great example so make make sure you're doing something smarter than just capture images like classify them at the same time i mean there's a huge huge thing huge amount of things that you can do in in nature conservation and all kinds of other applications, like opening the door for your pets, um, you know, identifying when somebody's walk, walking somewhere, and, and and is that a person? And we want to do something, um, automate some, something for that person. Another application um, from the audience is um, uh, from one of our um, participants. Um, for an elderly neighbor, I'm looking at a project to identify mail and other delivery trucks, so they know when to make the trek to the front door or mailbox. Um, this person has um, difficulty hearing. They don't usually hear the doorbell. But that's a great example of something that can actually change someone's life when they're hearing impaired is identifying, you know, who's there. And of course, we have things like the ring doorbell that does this in a very generic way. Is there someone in front of your doorbell? But actually identifying that it is the mail truck that's come by or it's a delivery person is a really interesting, interesting thing to be able to tell. Great. Any f other final ideas or, or things they want to bring up as areas of application for everyone? We're, we're getting people's thoughts going here for the Tiny Mount Challenge. Um, think about what they want to work on. And we're happy to have people share um, what they have in mind or, or really cool applications that they, areas that they, um, they've seen or have been thinking about. So I, I think, uh, Zach, that's me again. I, I think. Uh... Two more broad areas. I think uh, one area, I think it was mentioned like elderly care and medical care in, in general. Uh, and, and the other one is, I think we know that compared to regular computer vision for tiny ML vision, privacy is a big deal. It actually enables privacy. So um, maybe some applications where, where yeah. privacy is the key, basically, like you mentioned earlier, this is a track for, for blind people, basically when computer vision augments people's vision without kind of taking images because of the, mm -hmm. all the privacy issues. So I think those are also kind of very broad categories as well. Yep. Very good point. I think, you know, help, helping people um, operate better when they, when they have problems with, with vision or with hearing, um, I think is a great area. Um, working in nature con conservation is an amazing area. Smart home. Um, we are going to have a session tomorrow. If you want more ideas about the smart home, we do have Stacy on IOT, um, one of the best known journalists in the IOT space. Um, she runs an amazing mailing list and events. Uh, Stacy's going to be joining us in tomorrow's breakout to talk with, um, with me about the smart home 
and all the amazing applications that are starting to be enabled in the smart home um, for people, thanks to TinyML. So if you want to continue talking about applications, join us in tomorrow's breakout together with Stacy at the TinyML Summit. And we're going to have a really amazing um, discussion and dive into that world. And again, we'll be looking for the audience to participate. And one, one final application before we wrap up um, from Luke, um, with a thermal camera, you can begin to start to take remote measurements, maybe spot road icing or other dangers. That's a really good, good example too, of like telling what's going on in the environment before you get there or something that you can't very easily monitor. And I think we're gonna see those same kinds of things in industrial applications, right? A lot of industrial assets are located in very remote places on um, tanks, pipes, tools of different kinds. How are they doing? Are they being used right? Are they in the right position even? Are sometimes things that are really hard to tell um, for people in industry and takes a lot of manpower to go and check them out. So remote remote sensing in general is something that we can enable. And Zach, sorry again me. Uh, and one more very broad category is event driven cameras. I mean, in addition to the thermal mm. cameras, and there is, a, there is a whole community of people using event driven cameras. Uh, for this type of, and the, the hardware kits are also available for those. Really great point. This does not have to be about RGP cameras. You can you can go wild with very exotic camera technology th through thermal Im imaging to event cameras, and even other things like there are imaging technologies available that look like radar, right? But have very high resolution. There's imaging techniques available for non-human spectrum um, cameras. So looking at things like ult ultraviolet. Um, light um, as an example. So use your use your imagination when it comes to the camera technology if you can get a hold of it. And I think that would be a great addition to the challenge. With that, uh, I want to thank everyone. We're at the top of the hour. Um, thanks, Kobina from OpenMV joining us to to talk about OpenMV Cam and all the stuff happening around computer vision. Really, really interesting. Interesting discussion. Um, and thanks to the audience for all the application ideas. So we'll hear more from us about the vision challenge on April 15th. Thanks everybody. I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors. First, it's ARM uh, that develops software and hardware for TinyML. Welcome. Samsung, these three are the executive, sp executive sponsors. And, and then followed by Platinum Sponsors, PTA Compute, Lattice Semiconductors, and the Gold Sponsors are Brain Chip Corporation, Cisco, DSP Group, H Impulse, Emza Visual Sense, Gerald Matter Labs, uh, Green Waves Technologies, Hymex. Imagine Mob, Latent AI, Maxim Integrated, Pixel, Reality AI. SenseML, Silicon Labs, Sintiant, and Google TensorFlow, Exmos. And the silver sponsors are H Cortex, Hoots, and uh, Sinsense. 
Again, we are very grateful for their continued support, and this is a great testimony that uh, the foundation and this community is, re is really of, of huge interest for for the companies and 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 for the whole uh, for the whole world.